started, though. Um, so, let's see. Um, I do, we do have uh, all the uh, problems that's outstanding. Hopefully, it's finished. It's great. Thank you. So, we can check those. Um, so, a few things. Uh, next week, uh, we won't have a lecture on Thursday. Okay? Uh, or on travel. Um, and so, we'll have a makeup on a Wednesday evening um, at uh, 5.30, okay? Uh, so I will send you a reminder about that. And then um, we will have our exam the following week on this, at the same time. So I'll tell you more about that. Uh, so we'll be ready for that. Okay. All right. Um, so let's see where we have we been. So uh, last time we uh, were talking about uh, the how we deal with perturbation theory in the context of systems that have degeneracy. Okay. So there is a formal perturbation series. If you go through it, you see how it all works out. It's not so important. The main point is that when we have degeneracies in our zeroth order Hamiltonian, so there is some set of states that are degenerate. They form a subspace of states that all have the same energy in the absence of perturbation. There's some degeneracy we call G sub n, dimension of that subspace. When we add a perturbation, an additional Hamiltonian that is, could be big, it could be small, but we're, in this case we're thinking about it as a perturbation small Hamiltonian, then we can obtain the uh, energy eigenvalues to first order in that energy by just diagonalizing the whole Hamiltonian in that subspace. And that gives us the correct energies to first order. This is a perturbation. Okay? So that's what we do. Um, and if we wanted to, we could go on to look at the second order corrections, and they will involve octagonal elements of the perturbation Hamiltonian between states in different blocks. Okay? So we never have off-diagonal elements between states within the same blocks. Those have all been taken care of. And so there's no worry about uh, a degeneracy break blowing up uh, our perturbation series. Okay? So that's the formal structure. But the th main point here to remember and emphasize and keep in mind is that what, what happens when you have degeneracies is that you just diagonalize the whole Hamiltonian. Now, of course, and we'll see this in some homework coming up, maybe probably the next one. What happens if the degeneracy isn't exact? My program have near degenerate states, which we have sometimes, in which in where, where this energy denominator isn't zero, but it's really, really, really small. Okay? Well, then what would you do? Any thoughts about that? Well, we could go through the same procedure. I mean, the point is that we can still, to the same order, what we would decide is within some subspace, those states that have an energy, not, an energy separation that is very, very, very small compared to whatever the off diagonal matrix elements that couple those states, we consider that all a nearly degenerate subspace. And then we just diagonalize within that subspace, get all the solutions exact within that subspace, and that takes care of everything 
and then we can do higher perturbations relative to things that are much farther separated in energy compared to uh, what that off diagonal couple is. All right? So we'll see an example of that in homework. All right, so we looked at the example last time of uh, looking at the DC start shift, the sort of linear start shift, uh, when we are looking at how the states associated with the first excited state of hydrogen are uh, perturbed by the electric field. Okay? And what in that, that subspace is fourfold degenerate for hydrogen in the absence of any other perturbations. We're going to talk tomorrow about this. It's not really degenerate. This, of course, should be the 2s, not the 1s. This is all, sorry, messed that up. This is the 2s and the 2p and this is the 2s here. Sorry. Um, But in our lowest order approximation, these are degenerate states. And now we put on this electric field in the z direction. This is our perturbation Hamiltonian. And uh, the only, so what we do is we diagonalize this Hamiltonian uh, in this substance. Okay? And that gives us the then energy eigenvalues gives us the first order corrections to the states. And whatever the, whatever the eigenvectors are, are in this case the zeroth order eigenvectors of the system. Because of course any superposition of these states is equally well an eigenstate of H0. Okay? Um, and in this particular case, what we saw is that in fact there are only two states that are coupled. Uh, by this perturbation, the 1s and the 2p with m equals 0, and they have these off diagonal elements. And so to diagonalize, we just have to diagonalize this little 2 by 2, and that's easily done. And what we find are these kind of symmetric and anisymmetric combinations of the states. And the energy uh, eigenvalue is just the energy eigenvalues of this perturbation are just given by that as a function. It's linear first order in the electric field. Okay. And what we discussed last time is that this is an example of what we call symmetry breaking in the sense that, well, so there's a few things I want to say. Firstly, if we have degeneracies that are arising from symmetry, essential gen degeneracies, symmetries in H naught, if you add a perturbation that doesn't respect that symmetry, well, then the de degeneracy will be broken. So that's a generic thing. In this case, the, our zero third of Hamiltonian was uh, rotationally symmetric, right? Because it only went like, it went like 1 over r. It was a spherically symmetric potential. And that's what led to this, some of these degeneracies. When we add in the electric field, we're breaking that degeneracy. And because we break that degeneracy, that means as a function of strength of the field, we split the energy eigenstates. So that's a generic thing that we're going to see happening. Okay. Now, in this particular case, what we see is that uh, the, the example, what I want to say is that this notion of symmetry breaking, these states, superpositions of S and P states, are eigenstates of the Hamiltonian in zeroth order. They're also eigenstates with this perturbation, but they're eigenstates in zeroth order, but they are not eigenstates of elsewhere. They don't respect the symmetry of H0. Why is that possible? Well, that's possible because we have degeneracies. If we have degeneracies, we can have states 
that don't respect the symmetry of the Hamiltonian, but nonetheless are eigenstates of the Hamiltonian. Those are known as symmetry broken states. And you know, you hear about symmetry breaking all the time in the context of elementary particle physics. It's the same concept. Okay. All right. If it so happens that uh, yeah. H1 is also diagonal in the basis that you have chosen, yeah. then we, we don't have any problem, right? I mean, this is kind of a check to see whether uh, uh, our perturbation works or not. That's right. Yep. Yeah. That's correct. All right. Very good. So um, now, what I want to talk about today is a particular kind of situation we see that's fairly generic, happens quite often, and uh, has some important implications. And that's the following. Suppose we have a situation, consider a case where we have some Hamiltonian, which is a function of some external parameter. This is a classical parameter, like an applied field, like the electric field. Okay. And suppose now I look at the uh, eigenstates of the system. Okay. The uh, so I might this might be this H might be some, for example. Uh, Either h0 or h1 could be a function of this parameter. Uh, could have it either way, or both. All right? Now, if I look at the uh, energy levels of the system as a function of lambda, they're going to shift around. Right, the, whatever these eigenstates are, the energy levels will change generally as a function of lambda. And it might be the case that at some particular critical lambda, these two energy levels get very close to one another. Okay? All of a sudden, let's do it the other way. Let's say we let's make eight zero. Then all of a sudden, what was a non-degenerate perturbation becomes something there, a degenerate perturbation. And what happens to the nature of these energy levels, so this is an energy, as a function of this perturbation? Well, there's a couple of things that could happen. If these two levels uh, have no off diagonal matrix elements with respect to H1, they would just cross right through one another. This guy would go up, continue to go up, and this guy would continue to go down, because there would be no mixing between them if this had no off diagonal matrix elements between them. But that's generically not the case. It's quite often the case that they will. And what will happen is these two levels will mix so what was previously a crossing, where two levels become degenerate, is no longer a crossing. And these two levels will tend to repel one another. And this kind of thing is called an avoided crossing. So the two levels start approaching one another in energy, and all of a sudden, they can't cross because they are mixed by H1, and then they continue on their way. And this is a, a very important kind of, of um, diagnostic that we see where we want to uh, have a situation where we create coherence or superposition between different levels. We change parameters, bring those two levels together, see whether they mix in this coherent manner. If they do, we'll get an avoided crossing. 
So it's a one way in which one can look for coherent quantum superpositions of states to see whether those energy levels have an avoided crossing or not. That's a signature of that. So we want to study this kind of phenomenon uh, and uh, do it in a somewhat generic fashion. So let me bring up my notes here. And uh, let me get started. Right. OK. So um, to study this kind of situation, what we can do is we can look at um, this in the situation where we only have two levels that are coming together. OK? Level one and level two, say, whatever they are. One and two, it doesn't matter what I call them. They mix together in this way. Now, whereas here this might have been sort of level one, level two, when they get close together, they're going to somehow become superpositions of what was previously level one and level two. In the same way that was pre what was previously we could have thought of as the 2s and the 2p state, as we get away, we become these superpositions. Okay. So how are we going to treat this problem? So this is avoided. So let's talk about the avoided crossing of two levels. To do that, we're, if we have a, any kind of situation where we have two levels, any two-level system is isomorphic. is the problem of this is a spin one half in a magnetic field. Now why is that true? Why, why what about the magnetic field? Why is any any problem that has to do with the dynamics of a two level system equivalent to studying the problem of a spin one half particle in a magnetic field. Well, what we know is that if I have a Hamiltonian that is describing any two level system, I can always decompose this in the following way. It's some amount of the identity plus some amount of sigma x some amount of sigma y and some amount of sigma z. Right? This is, I call this a classical vector B dotted into the vector of Pauli matrices. Any Hamiltonian can be decomposed in this way, as we discussed last semester and we talked about in office hours with some of you yesterday, because we know that the set, the identity, sigma x, sigma y, and sigma z form a basis of two by two matrices. Right? So that means no matter what or, or operators on a two-dimensional Hilbert space, it's the same thing. So I can write any Hamiltonian, no matter what it is, if it is the Hamiltonian on a two-dimensional Hilbert space, it looks like this. And this is nothing more than you know, some constant, this is independent, this is some constant term that's irrelevant, really, plus b dot sigma. So we recall spin 
one half in a B field. Right? If we have spin one half in a B field, well, the Hamiltonian up to overall constant that we don't care about is whatever the magnetic, that's what, if we have a magnetic dipole moment in a magnetic field, that's a Hamiltonian. My magnetic dipole moment is proportional to the angular momentum through the gyromagnetic ratio. And for spin one half, S is h bar over two times sigma, which is gamma over two. Sigma, right? And so my Hamiltonian takes the form uh, of gamma And that we defined as, if we define this, this is a frequency, this is the long frequency. Along that direction, this is minus h bar omega, that sigma over two. So this is the generic form of a spin in a magnetic field, right? Okie dokie. So uh, we know everything about the solution to this problem. Okay? And so let's look at a particular situation. Let's consider, let me write my magnetic field in this case. I'm going to break it up into a parallel component along the z direction and a perpendicular component perpendicular to z. This is dx in the x direction and dy in the y direction. And let's look at the eigenvalues and eigenvectors of this system. Okay. Well, in order to do that, let's just remind ourselves what the eigenvalues and eigenvectors are of this so the eigenvalues of, of this Hamiltonian are what? Plus or minus h bar over 2. Plus or minus the magnitude of this vector over 2, right? So the eigenvalues here, e plus or minus, in this case it's minus or plus, uh, the magnitude of this over 2. How do we know that? Well, the Hamiltonian I can write as this, where I've written this vector as its magnitude in some direction. And the eigenvalues of the sigma matrices 
are plus or minus 1. No matter what direction this is pointing in. This could be the x direction, this could be the y direction, it could, or it could be any direction. So these are the eigenvalues. And what are the eigenvectors? Well, the eigenvectors are the eigenvectors of this operator. And what are the eigenvectors of that? They're spin up and spin down along that direction. Okay? So we have plus, oh, and that's up along n, and minus, down along n. Now, of course, any vector in the Hilbert space can be written in terms of spin up and spin down along the standard axis, the z axis, right? So, how do we do that? Let me remind you about that. So, let's say here's a physical sphere. To the, we're thinking about this at the moment as a physical magnetic field that's pointing in some direction in three-dimensional space. All right? So here's the z-axis, and this is nothing like a sphere, so let's fix it. Let's try. So here's the direction piece of it direction of my B field, and it, you know, has some projection onto the plane at some angle phi with respect to the x-axis and angle theta with respect to the z-axis. Okay? And now what I want to do is write the vector say, spin up and spin down in Hilbert space, that is along this direction. You want to have an idea how you might get such a vector? Use the rotation operator. Use the rotation operator. So let's do that. So I can think about this vector in twofold. Firstly, I start with spin up along Z. And then I rotate it down in the, I rotate it around the y-axis in the z-x plane so that it makes the angle theta with respect to the z-axis, but it's still at phi equals zero. Okay? So that's, you know, this vector in the at z plane at this angle theta. And then I rotate it around the z-axis by the amount of phi and bring it to there. So it's a series of two rotations. Okay? So my spin up along n will be first I rotate around the y-axis by theta. And then I rotate around the z-axis by phi, acting on spin up along z. Okay? And then the same thing for spin down. All right? So, what are these operators? U to the minus i of jy over h y. Right. So I'm let's saying. remember us that if I have some axis of, so, p sub j, and I rotate by some angle, oh, I don't know, uh, Side, that this is e to the minus i, the angle, the spin, in this case j is s, over h bar, dotted into the direction of, of the axis. Okay? So that's the general direct definition of the rotation operator. In this case, this is a spin one half, so that's h bar over two times sigma, so it's 
EJ dotted into sigma, right? Using the relationship. And we know that we can write this in a simple way because of the fact that the Pauli matrices all square to one. This has the form that everyone is going to memorize, and you're going to do it now. That this is cosine the angle over two times the identity minus i times sine the angle over two times the Pauli matrix along the direction. This is a useful, useful form. So if I have, this is an SU2 rotation. It's a unitary matrix on 2 by 2 with determinant 1 as that form. All right? So now we can do this for this particular case. Um, and so the rotation around the y-axis by theta is cosine theta over 2 times the identity minus i sine theta over 2 times sigma y. Okay. And now we just plug in, this is, you know, in, in the standard basis, the z basis, And this is minus i. So this has the form cosine theta over 2, sine theta over 2, minus sine theta over 2, cos theta over 2. And the rotation around the z axis, well, it should be diagonal in the z basis because we're rotating around the z-axis, and indeed it is. So in the z-basis, it doesn't matter, the identity is always the identity, and this is diagonal. So this looks like um, e to the minus i phi over 2 e to the plus i phi over 2. Okay. So with that said, what we see is that spin up along the direction n, where the direction n is specified by these two polar angles, theta and phi is equal to, in, written in respect to the z basis, So arbitrary spin up along 
the direction specified by theta and phi has this form. Now, I should say that typically, you know, we could write any other phase convention we like. Typically, you will see, choose a different phase convention. Factor that guy out and get rid of it so that we only have one phase. typically what we would write. Okay. So that's just a different phase convention. I've just factored out this e to the minus 5 or 2. And that's typically how you see this written. And similarly then, spin down along z, or along that direction, n, would be equal to what? Well, that's got uh, this would be cos theta over 2 spin down along z. Uh, I'm going to write the other way around. Sorry. Does this agree with for spin up along, can spin down along x? Just as a check on that. Say e sub n is the x direction. What is theta and phi in this case? Well, theta in that case is 90 degrees, and phi is 0. Right? So that becomes cosine of 45 degrees, which is 1 over root 2, and sine of that, which is 1 over root 2, and the phase is 0. So that's a, a superposition, spin up plus spin down over root 2. That's spin up along x, right? And then the other one is minus, and that's spin down along x. Along the y direction, theta is pi over 2. And phi is also pi over 2. Right? And in that case, again, we have the equal superposition of these guys, but now the phase is i. So the angle theta here, what we typically call, we call theta here, is what's called the mixing angle. It tells us how much superposition we have of spin up and spin down. And phi is, what we, is the phase. So any spin in the equator of the sphere is an equal superposition of spin up and spin down with 50-50 probability. And the angle phi tells us 
where, where I'm rotated in this plane, which tells us the phase relationship between spin up and spin down. Now that's for a physical magnetic field. We're going to abstract that in a moment. So let's go back to our problem of the uh, issue of the avoided crossing, which we say had this form. And we're going to look at it in the following way. So let's ask the question, what are the eigenvectors and eigenvalues of this system for a fixed, so let's think about this problem. We have B, which we wrote as a parallel component along the z-axis, and then some curved component. And let's look at the energy eigenvalues as a function of the parallel. So I'm going to look at the energy of the, and then the eigenvalues and the eigenvectors as a function of the parallel for a fixed B curve. So what do the energy eigenvalues and eigenvectors look like? Well, if B curve is zero, Well, then the eigenvalues are simple, right? The E plus and minus in that case will just be equal to minus and plus uh, that from what we just said, where omega parallel is that, right? So they correspond to the situation for spin up along Z. Those are, that's the eigenvector, right? Those are the eigenvector. And the other one looks like that. With the splitting here being h bar parallel, right? These cross. Why? Because when the magnetic field is zero, there's degeneracy. So right here they're crossing because the magnetic field is zero. So there's spin up and spin down, have the same energy. Okay? Now let's look at the case where B doesn't equal zero, B per. What's going to happen? Well, far away when B parallel is huge compared to B perp, then B perp is negligible. So we expect the energy eigenvalues to asymptote to these things, right? But once the uh, B parallel gets sufficiently small compared to B perp, well, then all of a sudden it's not a perturbation anymore, right? And then they're going to strongly mix. So what we expect is to see a situation where the two curves have an avoided crossing. So where they would have crossed in the absence of B perp, in the presence of B perp, those two levels don't cross, and they repel each other, and there's an avoided crossing. Okay. Um, so what are the energy eigenvalues and, and eigenvectors in this case? So when B curve doesn't equal zero, then the energy eigenvalues are just what we said over there. They're spin up and spin down along some direction. And the eigenvalues are plus or minus h bar over 2. Those are the 
eigenvalues, right? That's what we just wrote down. When b perp is zero, we got those guys. But when b perp is not zero, I get this this hyperbola. Now, what is the idea? This asymptotically far away, where b parallel is huge compared to b perp, these guys asymptote to spin down and spin up along the z-axis. But when I start shrinking b perp, I'm sorry, b parallel, such that I get in this avoided crossing region, little bit better. Then all of a sudden they make. So what are the what happens right here, right at the crossing point? What are the eigenvectors in that problem in that case? Eigenvalues we have. What are the eigenvectors? So in that case, my Hamiltonian is that right? eigenvectors of this system. Any thoughts? What's the eigenvalues? What about the eigenvectors? Plus and minus n. They're just spin up and spin down along this direction. Of course, that direction is what? That's some direction in the xy plane, right? So in this case, we have spin up and spin down along whatever that direction is, which is going to be, in this case, what's it going to look like? Well, those are spin up and spin down. So it's going to be a equal superposition with some phase Of course, if, if, phi, if phi is zero, that is to say, if the transverse magnetic field is in the x direction, then they will be just symmetric and anti-symmetric combinations. So right here, we have equal superpositions exactly at the crossing point. If we have this mixing, as we do in this case, then we have the equal superposition, generally with some phase that depends on what the direction of the transverse field is. Okay. Notice in what's going on here is that as we sweep this magnetic field, say, from all the way highly negative along the z direction to all the way highly positive along the z direction, the eigenstate of the Hamiltonian shifts its character. So it went from spin down along z to a state that is an equal superposition of up and down to spin up along z. What's going on? Well, we can understand that just thinking about this from the point just ge geometrically, right? So let's say I have a situation where I have a magnetic field, a parallel component that's very negative, and I have a small v perp. 
The lowest energy state is the state where the spin is aligned with the magnetic field. And that's the state that's like this. This is spin up along N, which is very close to the z-axis when this is big. Now I start shrinking this magnetic field, keeping this constant. So B parallel gets smaller and smaller and smaller, right, as I do that, as the cameraman. Now we come over here, as we shrink that magnetic field for this thing, all of a sudden, this is, say, B perfect on the order of B parallel. All of a sudden, the spin is along this direction. And when I shrink it all the way to the zero, then the spin is along the perf direction. And then I start increasing it. And so I am taking the spin and transferring it from spin down along z to spin up along z through this curve. Okay? And similarly along here. This picture of a spin in a big or small longitudinal field with a certain amount of transverse magnetic field there is the physics of an avoided crossing. Whether this is spin or any other two levels of, say, a molecule that come together, we can think about it as a pseudo-spin problem. It is mathematically equivalent. So we talk about this in the context of spin, but this doesn't have to be a spin in a magnetic field, because as we just described, any Hamiltonian that is restricted to a two-dimensional Hilbert space has this form. It can't be anything but. All right, let me get my notes. Uh, over there. Okay. Oh, gosh. I'll make one for that. Very good. By the way, um, if you wanted to know what the state was at some other thing, well, of course you could just find out it's, you find the exact solution. You could do perturbation theory. If this is a very, very big magnetic field compared to B per. Well, then I can just say there is a small admixture or a small superposition which says it's dominantly this, and then there's a small mixing in of spin up that is dependent on the octagonal matrix element divided by the energy denominator. You should try that. That would be approximately the eigenstate, which you could have found, in this case, exactly because it's a two-dimensional system, you can just do it, you just analyze it. Um, so let's just, for the moment, now let's just talk about something generic. So now we have a generic two-dimensional Hilbert space. say two levels, I'll call them one and two. All right? So those are like the two levels that we introduced this lecture with, where the two levels came together. And my Hamiltonian in this space is going to be equal to, well, it's going to have some E1, some E2, on the diagonal, and then some off diagonal terms. And since it's permission, it has that form. So now I ask you, what, how do I map 
this onto the equivalent spin in a magnetic field. Any ideas? Write it in terms of the Pauli matrices? Exactly. So we said that this was equal to some A. I mean, I don't have to have all the H bars and whatnot. We can screw that. Let's just get the basic constant. There's some constant times the identity and some vector dotted into the Pauli matrices. Right? So what are these numbers, A and vector B? Well, you remember we have the trace condition, the trace orthogonality of these. That remember that the trace of two Pauli operators, sigma i and sigma j, where I'm going to call sigma zero the identity, and sigma one, sigma x, sigma two, sigma y, sigma three, sigma z, that this is equal to y. Well, if sig i equals j, this is the identity, and the trace in that case is one times, I'm, I'm sorry, the trace is two. Right? So this will be equal to 2. Uh, and if they're different Pauli matrices, well, then that is like epsilon ijk times sigma k, but the trace of the other ones, right? Because this is 2 delta ij times the identity. I'm sorry. It's kind of plus i epsilon ijk sigma k. So the trace of that is that. Okay? So with that said, what I have is that A is equal to the trace of H with the identity over 2. And B is the trace of H with the power matrices over 2. Okay. So let's look at those components in this case. So A is just equal to the average energy. of those two, which typically we're setting equal to zero. It doesn't really matter what that is. We, put that in, we just call that zero of energy. Halfway in between them. What about this B operator? Let's go to this board. So BZ, which is what we call B parallel in our previous, is equal to the trace of H with sigma Z, right, over two. So what is that? Well, that's a half the trace of E1, E2 times the Pauli matrix one minus one, zero, right? Uh, and so that's going to be equal to this. So the difference in the energy of the zero or whatever this Hamiltonian is, is playing the role of the parallel magnetic field. Okay. What about B per? Well, let's look at B x. B x is the trace of H with sigma x. So that's equal to one half the trace of this matrix.
which is the real part of that octagonal matrix element. And similarly, by uh, the same procedure is the imaginary part of the octagon matrix Okay. So the what we come away with here is that if I have this two by two matrix, the difference in E1 and E2 plays the role of B parallel, and the off diagonal elements play the role of the perp, the things that mix those states. And the mixing angle on the pseudo-block sphere that we call theta, well, the tangent of that, if I look at that, the tangent of that is B per the magnitude of B per over B parallel, right? That's what that is. And that, according to this, this is equal to, you know, the magnitude of this guy over the energy difference. That tells me what the mixing angle is. And the uh, tangent of phi is the imaginary part of this over the real part. On the pseudosphere. Okay. So, um, Now I want to make a connection between this and the thing that we have studied previously in the notion of adiabatic time evolution. Um, so let's go to this board since we already have it written over here. Suppose that instead of thinking about this as a lambda axis, I think about this as lambda as a function of time. So I am changing this external parameter as a function of time. As a function, if I start in an eigenstate, say the ground state, it doesn't have to be, be any one of the eigenstates in initial time. As I change this parameter, I will move, if I do so adiabatically, I will stay in the instantaneous eigenstate of the system, right? We've studied that in a few different problem sets. Now, what happens, it's easy to stay adiabatic when the gap is big. But once I start, these two guys get together, there's a question is, am I going to go adiabatically through the crossing or cross through it this way, this is what we call diabatic, adiabatic. Does the population go like this and end up in this state? Or does the population go like that, adiabatically? Well, that depends on how fast I go through that crossing. I mean, unfortunately, I have erased what I shouldn't have erased in that back board there. But again, what we thought about this from the point of view of a spin in a magnetic field. If I start with a big field, the spin is locally processing around that big field. Now I'm changing 
the field, and it ends up spin up, and I've adiabatically transferred. The question of whether I can do that or not depends on how fast do I change from the, the magnetic field all the way in this direction to the magnetic field all the way in that direction, compared to how fast the spin is processing around the local field. If the precession rate is too, um, too slow, then all the, it, doesn't, it can't adiabatically follow, and it won't diabatically go through that transition. So let's study that. All right. So now I'm going to look at a generic crossing. I'm going to take just the, the aggregator again. I'm going to call that zero, so that I don't, I don't it doesn't really matter. It's, it's an overall shift in energy, and that's irrelevant to any dynamics. And I have this situation where I have my local asymptotes to that crossing. This near the crossing it looks like this. And I have my kind of situation of the avoided crossing, like that. And I want to study the situation under which I go adiabatically and the situation in which I go diabatically. All right. So um, I have my state one, my state two. This sort of one character over here, and this is sort of two character over here, and now I have this superposition of one and two in between. All right? Um, so let's see how I want to write this. So I'm going to define, so our Hamiltonian, let's write the Hamiltonian we had H E1 plus E2 plus H12 plus H12 star 2, 1, which we wrote as So this difference in energy, I'm going to call the detuning. So I'm going to call that delta, E1 minus E2, H bar delta over 2. That's what I'm going to call that. And we'll call this guy uh, a H bar times the frequency I'll call chi. That's just by definition. This is somewhat standard notation. I'm just going to define that as such. And we're going to change this detuning as a function of time. Okay? So now the question is, under what condition do I stay adiabatic? Well, we have the adiabatic theorem that we studied previously 
in homework. And the issue of whether I stay adiabatic or not depends on how fast do I go through this crossing compared to what this splitting is. Okay? So the condition for adiabaticity is the following, that whatever the local eigenstates are, that the octagonal element changes with a certain rate divided by the energy gap has to be much, much, much smaller than the energy gap itself. That's the adiabatic theorem that we studied in homework. So what does that mean in this case? Well, given that Hamiltonian, The rate at which I'm changing that detuning determines the rate of change of the Hamiltonian, right? That's what I'm changing here, okay? Spin up and spin down, well, that depends on what the local mixing angle is. So this is cosine theta over 2 spin up along z, which is the one state plus sine theta over two spin down along z and spin down along n is sine minus So, what do we have? Um, we need to calculate the off-diagonal matrix element between these two states of this in the numerator. Okay? So, equal to, yeah, and plugging those guys in, that's equal to minus h bar over 2, sigma dot, and plug all that in, you get cosine times sine minus sine times cosine, and you get 2 sine. And then in the denominator, I have the energy difference between these two. And that's equal to the square root of delta squared plus this h bar times omega. condition in this case tells me that
now, what the heck is sine of theta? Well, we have the tangent of theta over there, right? So the sine of theta is equal to the uh, opposite over the hypotenuse. So that's this over the square root of this plus this. That's the sine. We have the tangent over there. And now we have the sine of theta. So we put that all together. Uh, and what do we got? We have this guy cubed over this times this is much, much less than 1. Okay, that's just plugging in all those terms. I believe you provided an h bar. That should be h bar squared to move up some. Yeah, you, you fried an h bar. Oh, uh, could be, but it doesn't matter because all the h bars should cancel, so that's going to be all these guys are dimensionless. All right, so what's the point of this? Well, firstly, this condition is uh, most difficult to satisfy when delta is 0. OK, so right at the crossing. So the most stringent condition And the requirement thus is that this omega cubed, so it then becomes delta, I'm sorry, no omega, chi cubed. Do you have to find that for the greater than? Should it be uh, much greater than than one, not much less than one? Uh, you're right. Thank you, Stephen Spaffords. Thank you. Absolutely. Let's write it up, upside down. Okay. Or this. So we have a condition here. This parameter is known as the adiabaticity parameter. So, the condition under which I say adiabatic is if this is big or 1 over 8 is small. Now, we don't have time. It's in the notes, but I'll just now quote the answer. What Landau did was to solve this problem where the, based on a solution that was known from Zener, where this is going linearly through the crossing. So just as a function of time, it's going through the crossing. And now I can ask the question, what is the probability that as I go through this crossing, if I do so with this formula, that I end up making a diabetic transition? What is the probability of ending up here? And what Landau showed was that it's equal to e to the minus 2 pi times a, where a is the a to the density. And this is generically known as landau zener tunneling. Or this is known as a landau zener crossing. Is that a term anyone's ever heard before? But you know what it meant? Well, that's what it means. So it's a question of when I go through a crossing, an avoided crossing, do I stay adiabatic or do I go diabatic? My diabatic transition is suppressed if I have this kind of linear sweep through a, this kind of crossing by the amount dependent on the adiabaticity. It's called tunneling. 
but I think that term is nonsense. It has nothing to do with classically forbidden anything. I mean, this is, it's exponential, but that's the only connection to family that I, that I see. And the actual solution is just solving what happens when you change this pseudo-magnetic field in this wave linear. Okay. All right. So that's an important lab, just want to say, this is just an important component of degenerate perturbation theory. It's, such a, it's something we see all the time, where you have two energy levels that come close together, and then you ask, do they mix or do they not? You just diagonalize it. You think about this from the point of view of a pseudo spin in my head. All right, we have homework here. Come and get it. Uh, next lecture, we will.